Very good afternoon and welcome to this EPC policy dialogue on the Green Deal as a solution to our crisis riddled times, which launches a new EPC series called the Green Deal for Real. I'm Annika Hedberg, I'm Head of Sustainable Prosperity for Europe program at EPC and I'll be moderating today's event. I should mention that our new discussion series aims to encourage big thinking, get us to think also outside the box about the rational and the means for implementing the European Green Deal. And we believe that if we are serious about making Europe more sustainable, resilient, competitive and just, we need to do more to turn our pretty speeches in actual action. And this is not just about planning great measures for tomorrow, but seeing what we can do already today to accelerate the needed transition. And in the course of the series, we hope to bring along inspirational speakers, thinkers, doers, people who will challenge us with their ideas and suggestions for the way forward. And this is also what we hope to do today. In our crisis driven times, the pressures on our leaders are enormous. The, the Russian war in Ukraine, with its numerous repercussions, including for our economy and our society, uh, for our energy and food systems, comes on top of several crises the EU is already battling with. The EU is still recovering from the 2008 and 2011 economic crisis. The pandemic with its economic and social repercussions continue to demand the EU leaders attention. And furthermore, the urgency to address the planetary crisis from climate change to ecological destruction is growing by the day. Now, at the same time, when the pressure is high, it's easy to go for just reacting to the ongoing crisis. And if these reactions are not carefully considered, this can lead to short-sighted costly decisions, policies and investments. So this is also the setting in which the EU and its leaders operate today. Swift decisions are being taken now to address, for example, the challenges to our energy and food systems that will have both short and long-term impacts for Europe. So in this context, we are delighted to have Anthony Acosta, Senior Diplomatic Advisor from Cabinet of Executive Vice President Franz Timmermans from European Commission, Sandrine Dixon de Cle, co-president uh, from Club of Rome, as well as Ville Niniste, member of the European Parliament um, representing the Greens, join us today to discuss what role could and should the European Green Deal play in guiding the EU, its member states, and European businesses as they try to react to the ongoing challenges. And as being in a crisis mode is not new to the EU, we've been faced with numerous crises, challenges, emergencies in the last years. We hope to also use the occasion today to reflect on the lessons of the past in managing crises of today and those of the future. So how can we use lessons of history to design cost-effective measures today that will bring real benefits for people, business and the planet? With these words, I'll be very happy to hand over to Anthony Acosta, um, who will take the floor and then we'll hand over to Sandrine and Ville to join the discussion as well. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Annika, uh, and great to be there with Sandrine and, and Ville. Uh, and, and all of you, I can't see anyone and I, I can't wait for the moment we're in a, in a real hall. Mm. Uh, you have to stop me if I go on beyond the 10 minutes because I don't want to eat into anyone's uh, uh, time. It's a very, very auspicious uh, time. Um, when we started the Green Deal in December 2019, bolting out of the stables, we knew that the window of opportunity was open, but we also knew it could be closed. And I think it was three days after we put the climate law, which is our political savnat to climate neutrality in 2050, when we put that on the table three days after suddenly COVID broke, um, and our first concern was how would this wreak havoc on human health? But our second concern was, uh, so would this be the event, as Macmillan said, that would ditch the Green Deal? And funnily enough, uh, uh, in contrast to what happened in 2008 after Al Gore had what is arguably the best PowerPoint ever, uh, and for nine months everyone spoke about climate change and then Lehman Brothers fell. But 
interest, if we look back, if anything, COVID kind of accelerated uh, the green transition because the, the European leaders and the commission embedded in the DNA of the recovery, a green and digital transition. So it was put on steroids because people thought, well, we're going to unlock two trillion, close to two trillion euros. We can spend the money only once. We have to spend it right from the get go. And so as we went to Glasgow, which is, by the way, was a lot better, uh, uh, a lot better outcome than uh, some have spun, even if, if there's still a lot to do. But Russian troops were amassing on the borders of Ukraine. And, and uh, uh, as unfortunately we have seen, the unthinkable uh, became thinkable and happened. And now we're in, in, in a new crisis. And I, I, my boss, Franz Timmermans, always said, you know, there's a world before the 24th of February and a world after, because the ramifications of what Putin has done there are still, we still don't know how, but it's going to change a lot. Uh, and, and again, our first concern is, so what does this mean for our security? What does it mean for our food security? What does it mean for our energy security? And there too, we came with the response to say, listen, the EU, we are staying the course. And I, I think I can't say it strongly enough. We are staying the course. We might find different tra trajectories uh, and we might accelerate in parts. So when we came out with Repower EU as requested by the European uh, Council, we're basically doing three things. First is for the short term, and nobody and people might not like it, but the first is diversification. So we're scrambling to get gas and, and fossil fuels, which at the moment are still uh, the ones that, that keep us uh, warm and cool and, and, and keep our economy growing, we're gonna diversify. Uh, and it also may change the role of gas as a transition fuel. It might be that coal, uh, uh, which is you know, almost evil, but coal will be extended, coal use might be extended. But we're also gonna do energy savings at the same time. We are gonna grow our economy and we can save our energy even more. So we're gonna up uh, uh, the goals from 9% to 13%. And finally, we're going to accelerate the clean energy transition. So we've upped the targets from 40% in 2030 to 45. So if we do all that together, in fact, we're taking a different route, but we're still on track uh, for climate neutrality and for the right reasons. The IPCC reports, unfortunately, I have to start with Project Fear, but the IPCC reports just give us ever more dire warnings on where we're heading, and, and literally we're running out of time. And the devastating effects of climate change reaching tipping points, but also, and people don't mention this often enough, what is happening to our natural environment, because those two are umbilically linked. You cannot just look at climate and forget about nature. But those tip tipping points are, are terrible. I mean, think of droughts, floods, uh, um, uh, uh, harvests that are, are you know, wrecked, uh, houses, real estate underwater, migration, uh, uh, conflicts over water and arable lands. All these, these are huge costs. And the longer we wait with adapting to it and, and finding a, 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 a solutions to, to, to stop these uh, stop us getting to those tipping points, the higher the price will be. And I think it's important because people say, you're needing so much money to invest in this green transition, but they forget the costs of non-action. And these costs of non-action are already unfortunately being paid uh, uh, today. So we're going to, we're going to stay the course uh, we're going to do it, but it's not just because of the fear and, and the devastating effects of climate change. It's also because arguably you could say that this 150 year old fossil fueled economy was sputtering, become volatile, is literally burning up. And decisions that uh, companies and societies would have had to make in 10 to 12 to 20 years are being made earlier because of, of what I just said. Uh, and they offer a better future. Don't forget it. It's a positive proposition what we put on table. If we can clean our air, at uh, the OECD calculated that 400,000 people in the EU die prematurely because of air pollution. That is not normal. We don't have to accept that. We can change that if we electrify uh, uh, with renewable energy our, our transportation. If we have less pesticides in our farmland, which again, healthier food, cleaner water, cleaner air, greener cities, uh, this is all good because, and I think it's very important, my boss says this all the time, we don't do it for the planet per se. The planet has existed without us for more than three and a half billion years, and it will continue to exist if we manage to kill ourselves off. 
We're doing this for the health and well-being of people themselves and the future generations that come. And uh, uh, David van Rijbroek, a, a Belgian a philosopher, historian, uh, said it very nicely. We cannot continue to colonize the future of our children because, frankly speaking, uh, you know, I, I'm 52. It might be annoying for me. I'll be fine. But what about my four teenage children and what did those come after me? We, we have a responsibility. And so uh, we think we can do it. Uh, we have the technology already. We have the policies. We have the money. What we now need is political courage to push through. And we already see that by merely putting proposals on the table, markets are moving there. And other governments are also moving there. Not everyone yet, but you can see that momentum. And it's really, really breathtaking where companies say, you know what? What we wanted is some regulatory certainty that that is the direction we're going in. And when we have it, we're willing to invest it and change our business models and go there too. I think the automotive industry is a great example. So once the market internalizes this and understand that's where the money is, that's where your competitiveness is, I don't think there's going to be, we, we're not going to stop this. Uh, and, and let me just uh, end on this note, and then I'll give it over to you, Anika, is that the greatest injustice, the greatest swindle of arguments is to say to those people who will be hit hardest, to say that if we do today what we used to do yesterday, tomorrow will be just fine. You will be better off. And that is a great injustice, and we cannot allow that to happen. So thank you. Uh, I hope I stayed within the 10 minutes. Over to you. Thank you, Anthony. Um, thank you for these reflections and also providing a bit of this context on what's, uh, what's happening at the moment and also for reminding for the urgency of action. I think that's something that we'll be happy to come back to is obviously it's this problem with the short term measures at times of crisis. And while yourself was saying that uh, we will be taking a different route, the question really is how do we ensure that taking this different route doesn't slow down the process that we really are using this moment to actually accelerate the transition. Mm. So, but I'm happy to come back to this sure. later. I'll, I'll hand over to Sandrine. Uh, it's wonderful to have you with us. Thanks. Thank you so much, Annika. And uh, I'm, I very much want to build on what Anthony has said and also mention that I was just in another discussion that also was unpacking these very important points. And I must say, as I had said to you today, I seem to be doing at least two to three presentations on this important point of where do we go from here? How do we take into consideration the fact that we are now faced with the greatest tipping points we've ever seen? We've got planetary tipping points, we've got social tipping points, and we have health tipping points. And we're actually having to deal with all of those in the midst of chaos. And so I, I think that some of your questions are really key. So first, yes, the blueprint for the way forward absolutely has to be the European Green Deal. And it has to be the European Green Deal on steroids. Um, it really does because we need to now not go back to business as usual and stranded assets. And it's hard when you look at the Ukrainian situation and you see what's happening in terms of food prices, also the prices in terms of raw materials, and of course, fertilizer and energy in general. And all of those are wreaking havoc globally, but also at the European level. And so these kind of, this instinct of knee jerk reactions of, although I agree with Anthony, we need to figure out what we do in the short term in terms of ensuring that we have access still to gas and to oil. This is the moment to go far beyond our usual practices of depending on this fossil energy. And, and I think what COVID has shown us and also what the Ukraine has shown us is these unholy dependencies that we have in terms of our value chain. This is something that we've really pointed out in our systems compass work that we did with Yanis Potochnik, former commissioner in systemic, which is to show that actually we are so dependent on these resources and we've known this and yet the Green Deal could stop this dependency. But it also needs to be taken into consideration in terms of our relationship to the rest of the world and our relationship to people. So the way we do that, if we're going to look at people, planet and prosperity and implementation of the European Green Deal is, first of all, make sure that we look at what are the key barriers to realizing this vision. 
you know, what, how did it happen that after two and a half years of working on the taxonomy that was supposed to decide what green truly was, we had a political decision that allowed us to bring back nuclear and gas. We cannot allow that to happen as we move forward. We must stay true to the objectives of climate neutrality and ensure that we do move forward. This means that we have to get better at the European level of communicating the European Green Deal, what that truly means to member states. It means that we have to understand short-term political cycles and be much more strategic in terms of the potential barriers to the vision of the Green Deal, which tend to go back into sovereign member state decision-making and dependencies on resources. It means that we also need to ensure that we address surface, uh, sorry, systems thinking and not just the surface sectoral thinking. That we start to optimize. Anthony said, for example, our new repower policy, and absolutely it has to be around how do we look at supply, but how do we ensure that we really focus on demand? How do we shift our consumption practices? How do we actually bring people on that journey, tap into the consciousness post COVID? where people realized, oh, actually, what's most essential to me is not how many pairs of trousers I have because I'm on a Zoom call every day, or how many cars I have in the garage because at the end I can't use them because I can't go out. The fact is, the most important was, do I have access to Medicare? Can I have access to a hospital? Is my family safe? Do I have access to food, water, et cetera? That is where we need to tap right now because people and the surveys that we've undercated, uh, undertaken, even at the G20 level, demonstrate that 75% of the population is ready to move towards a well being economy, which goes far beyond wealth and growth at all costs. And more than 90% believe that climate change is here. So, so I really think that we need to put the European Green Deal on steroids. And for me, what that means is unpacking some of these tensions, getting smarter in terms of how we really put in place the right taxation policies and the right policies at the broader um, level in terms of work development, employment, etc. So we can stimulate the economy for people and make them realize that the European Green Deal is good for their lives and livelihoods and not just about a so-called fluffy environmental theory. The last point I will make, and this is very true also to Anthony's point, nature has to be at the heart of this. And we need to make people realize, and I think they did through COVID in many cases, that actually we are not separate from nature. We are part of nature. Planetary survival is also our survival. And so really upping the bar in terms of the communications on that level is, is really fundamental. I'll, I'll leave it at that and hopefully we can get into more of the detail. Wonderful, thank you Centrine for your reflections and always uh, inspirational thoughts there. Um, something I'll be very happy to come back into discussion is indeed the role of citizens, the consumers and you yourself was talking about shifting this focus on demand. And certainly this is an area where so much more could be done also in the context of the current crisis we're in. So very happy to pick on that, Lisa. Ville, absolute pleasure to have you with us. Um, I'm sure that we have a, a lot of very similar <laughs> thoughts coming across from our speakers, but happy to hear uh, what your thoughts are. And on, also, if you have any thoughts on the lessons of the past crisis, that would be very interesting to hear. Thank you very much, Annika, and a pleasure to be here. I'm in Strasbourg. Uh, we've just had the session of the European Parliament and, and voted on part of, parts of the climate package. Some of it went well and some of it went less than well, but the outcome is still that, that the Parliament, those uh, proposals of the Commission that the Parliament accepted, have actually higher environmental and climate integrity than the original proposal, including my own LULUCF regulation that I, I have been working on, and then the uh, renewal of ETS was referred back to the committee precisely because the majority of the parliament thought it had been weakened. So I think it's still a, a message of, you know, parliament being very uh, committed to addressing uh, Green Deal and, and climate change with proper measures. We just have to take a few more weeks on the ETS. But yes, um, when it comes to Green Deal as a solution to our, our crisis riddle times and also how to handle crises in the long term, 
Um, I have actually a background myself as a, a researcher on Russian foreign policy. I did my master's thesis on how Russia uses uh, energy as a source of geopolitical power in 2003. And, and, and after that, I've noticed that this theme keeps popping up, up and now I'm working in the European Parliament with uh, climate and energy issues. And I have been long uh, trying to speak for, for European energy sovereignty also as a security solution. And I think everybody understands that now. So it was something that, you know, some governments like the German government still thought that you can, you know, try to be trade to try to include countries that are not super democratic into, into our, uh, our values and get them to a more progressive path. But I think uh, uh, one lesson we have to learn from, from the war in Ukraine and how Russia has used the energy as geopolitics. And that, that lesson is that we need to create an economy where we are not dependent on fossil fuels and, and other powers that, that uh, export those. Most of fossil fuels globally come from sources that are not really the you know, source of democracy in our, our development. And often uh, geopolitical power based on uh, land resources and, 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 and fossil resources is a source of conflict and, and uh, kind of like a tool to, to uh, create uh, power politics globally that, that uh, are negative to, to human rights and, and uh, rule of law and, and uh, democracy. So I think we have a broader objective with the Green Deal now than we had three, three, three year, years ago. Now the goal is not just to address climate change, but also to create a Europe where we have our own industries uh, bringing technological solutions uh, to, to the climate issues, uh, where we have our industry also taking uh, seriously the loss of biodiversity, and where we do regulation to do all of that. But it is, this is also a way of, of creating energy sovereignty, more local solution, more people participation, more energy communities, where power is, is uh, uh, spread in our, our own countries more uh, more advantageously for, for the population and where we are less dependent on other uh, outside sources uh, of, of, um, of energy like, like Russia. So I think uh, if you look at what has happened uh, in, in, in the EU after the, the war in Ukraine started, and also I would say also the corona crisis in a way has been a wake up call when it comes to the uh, a certain element of, of um, unreliability in being too dependent on global global chains of production where a lot of core production like even in medicine is is uh, left to the countries in asia for example it's interesting that in europe we can't even produce a basic uh, medicine like paracetamol without having some ingredients uh, coming in from asia to that and i don't when i speak about changing all of this i don't speak for protectionism. I don't think the protectionism is, is not the answer, but what, what we need to do is to create an economy that at its core protects human rights, uh, promotes progress when it comes to environmental and climate uh, regulation globally. So we need to take uh, also trade policies as part of this. And also that we get, get products to the markets that solve the crisis by themselves as well. And, and by this uh, be, becoming a larger economic player in the global transition in solving biodiversity crisis, the climate crisis, and also being more resilient to different kinds of crises like, like pandemics. I think we also can show a way for, for other countries to be more, uh, more resilient and, and self-sufficient in, in such crises. And also then the values that you promote with this kind of approaches creates a global, global trading rules that are in essence uh, free, we will promote free trade, but it will also be fair trade. So you take the environmental costs of a production into the cost of the product. And I think uh, the CPAM, the, the, the proposal on, on ETS and, and the combination of those two are some, some of the, the European proposals to also show that even those countries that are not super willing to address climate change by themselves, they have to do it or they have to pay pay for the uh, externalities to the environment uh, of their production. And I'm also happy that the Commission has taken on board uh, the, the regulation on deforestation. So we stop importing and also producing ourselves products that create uh, uh, deforestation in, in the tropics, but also in Europe, in a country like Finland, where I come from, 
forest industry is very intensive. They sometimes say that they are magically sustainable by just being there. That's what they usually like to say. But it, you know, we also need to realize that we have to do things better. But at the same time, with, with the trading power EU has, we can also make sure that others do things better. We can also uh, support local communities, uh, indigenous peoples in, in places where the governments are, are not supportive of them by making sure that trade is fair. And I think this is a big shift as a green politician that Green Deal and environmental politics is not just a side note in the Commission's policy, but it's the core of what they do. And I have been, you know, I've worked with climate politics for 20 years and having been a Minister of Environment 10 years ago, being into the global climate meetings, sometimes you kind of like become pessimistic about how much uh, politicians mean what they say, because very often we have, we have failed. But I have been impressed by the commitment what both Timmermans um, as the VP responsible for the Green Deal and also von der Leyen have, have continued to sow for the Green Deal, even in these circumstances we have this spring. And finally, in my, my starting notes, I would also like to say that, you know, we should not just think about changing the sources of energy, but we should also change the, the core of how we use, use resources. So coming into a question of what is sustainable, uh, how green growth can play in uh, creating a sustainable economy. We have to think about energy savings, energy efficiency, and, and just like 1% of in increase in energy efficiency uh, can uh, uh, relate to, to a reduction of 2.6% of gas use in Europe if, when it's energy efficiency in solutions that currently use gas. So we are not just replacing fossils with, with renewable energy, we also need to look at the consumption and production patterns we have moving to circular economy. And that's what I've been working personally very much on with the Lulu CF uh, regulation, which promotes uh, carbon sinks in Europe. Because if we start to also in land use, promote carbon sink farming and uh, more sustainable methods of forestry and increasing restoration of peatlands and wetlands that have been degraded, we can actually with very cost efficiently, with relatively low costs, uh, create new products that have huge markets when it comes to carbon farming. And we get a lot of increase of sinks. So we should uh, start to realize that added value for nature, added value for climate, also in land use, should be, you know, there should be a market in, uh, incentive to, to invest into those because that's a way to go to carbon neutrality and then beyond to carbon negativity. And finally, also, some people say that we should stop doing all of this because of, you know, Russia invading Ukraine and we have a food crisis, but we are also very dependent on fertilizers currently in our agriculture. So by increasing carbon sink farming, for example, we are actually supporting regenerative farming uh, circular economy approach with less need for fertilizers, which we are very dependent on coming from Russia currently. So we have actually a more self-sufficient uh, land use and agriculture sector by at the same time uh, promoting climate and, and, and biodiversity solutions. So I think in the end, we have to realize that as a humanity, we can't create well-being by fighting against our planet and then our soil and our forest and our, our uh, agricultural fields. We have to work together with them. Wonderful. Thank you, Ville, for your reflections and uh, also about reminding of the current state of play and there's a lot of the decisions that we're making at the moment um, could actually get us on the right track if we just get them right. We have already uh, received, I see, three questions from the audience, uh, so I'll take these. We have one from Kitiran who's saying that Green Deal obviously requires massive renewable energy, um, massively renewable energy, green electricity, and all of this will require not only massive investments, but also raw materials. So what should be done to deliver these materials in a competitive and sustainable way? Then I have a question from Matthias Duve, um, and this is especially uh, addressed to Anthony. That's um, the EU long-term strategy of 2018, clean planet for all with climate neutrality goal on the table that is now central to the European Green Deal. Four years to crisis climate law later, it, is, it has information that is out of date in many places. Is the commission considering an update to the strategy to spell out a revised path to net, net zero and guide policymaking in the coming years? 
And then we have a question from Rafael Cayuela. And uh, I'll just shorten it just to say that um, she's suggesting that should we not be expanding the green deal to the great deal, mm -hmm. uh, which includes sustainable digital social aspects. And uh, she recognizes, for example, that um, income inequality is a serious challenge to the transition. And also, obviously, we need to find ways to internalize the environmental and social externalities. Uh, we need to move from supply to demand policies. So some of these things we already addressed uh, in the interventions before, but um, I'm happy to come back to all of you uh, and give you a chance also to react to what you've heard from, um, from the other speakers, but then also any reflections you have on these questions. And Sandrine, please go first. Sure. So I'll, I'll reflect also a little bit on, on what's just been said and integrate that into the, the questions. Excellent um, question, of course, from Guy. Hi, Guy. Um, someone that I know very well, and it's working very hard at Eurometo, to, to look at the responsibility of the metals industry. And I think that your question is spot on. And we all know this is a, a key problem. And I think there are different ways to resolve this. One is there is an open discussion. And Guy and I have had this conversation around whether we open up new mines in Europe or old mines. Um, and, and I think it is a valid conversation to have, taking into consideration, obviously, the fact that we cannot backtrack on our biodiversity commitments, nor Nature 2000 commitments, nor can we backtrack in terms of the way in which we want to decarbonize. So we really need to look at this. I, I think the other key point is, is clearly when we look at the border taxation issue, and this is, comes to Vile's point, you know, how do we start to place a value on materials? We are not placing a value on materials and we're not placing a value, and this comes a little bit to the last question that's being made by, by Rafael, which is we don't place a value on social capital either, whether it be outside of Europe or whether it be inside Europe. Clearly, the, the great predicament that we are faced with, and this comes to the question around the Great Green Deal, um, or the Great Deal, and I would say the New Deal, is the fact that actually, if we're going to do a Green Deal properly, we can't do it in isolation. So we do, and that's the, the key discussion that we've had through our international systems compass, we have to think about what are the principles that are going to govern our relationships with the rest of the world. If we are going to stay true to our Green Deal principles and social principles, we need them to make sure that we support outside Europe as well in working with most of the world, those countries in the South that are actually, in most cases, exporting their resources to us and their raw materials. So we absolutely need to look at exactly these this data which demonstrates very clearly what this transition is going to mean in terms of raw materials what the impact then is on third countries that are exporting where can we actually change our consumption habits optimize the way in which we produce different materials and also technologies and then ensure that we build relationships with other countries rather than continue these old unholy colonial relationships or dependencies that we've had from the past. So my response is partly, we have to focus on consumption, not only on ensuring that we have more raw materials, we have to address the fact that they're coming from outside and how do we look at that in terms of pricing structures, but also how we look at the way in which we shift to green deal, social deal type of relationships with the rest of the world. And then we need to make sure that we bring people on the journey in Europe to bring in that social element that is most fundamental. And that means looking at new types of social contracts with companies and also with government. And that's why through our new book, Earth for All, a survival guide to humanity, where we've been working very clearly with Johan Rockström and other scientists and economists, we're talking about a universal basic dividend. We're talking about creating a citizen fund. We're really talking about placing a value on people, but also ensuring that we place a value on the global commons, which then will create the taxation possibilities and the revenues to bring it back to people so that they can thrive and not just survive. Thank you, Santrine. I'm looking at uh, Anthony Ville, uh, which of you would like to go first? Anthony. 
Yeah, thank you. There's so many issues that were interesting uh, that I noted down. Uh, but let me start with uh, uh, what Vila said about uh, uh, the values. I think that's that's very important. Uh, what we are doing is is you can have a society that grows. You can have a society that gives more material a, a comfort to its people. And you can have a society that even tackles the climate change uh, at the cost of freedom, at the cost of social credits and constant monitoring. And we know what that model is. And we also know we don't want that model here. So uh, as my boss always uh, goes after the Green Deal, always in the same breath, it is about values. Uh, and that means in our external relations. So for instance, uh, Vila, I'm very glad you mentioned deforestation. <clears throat> I worked very closely on that one. That's a tremendously important piece of legislation, which is now entering the end game in the council and in parliament. And, and just allow me briefly to say, uh, anyone looking at that uh, legislation, please don't only look at scope, because it's very easy to comprehend. Should we put another product on there, another palm product, and all, another derivative? Or should we put all the ecosystems in? I mean, in my wildest dream, I'd love to do it. But also keep a very close eye on the heart of the mechanism, because the way we put it on the table, it has real teeth. And I'm, I'm just concerned that we can defend those teeth and not extract the teeth, like have a carve out here on traceability, have a carve out here on benchmarking. So I just wanted to make that point. This is about our values. And then going back to the other point that also Sandrine made and, and the questioner about uh, uh, the great deal uh, or the great new deal, uh, ultimately, and this is what Mr. Timmermans always says, we will have a just transition or we just won't have a transition. I mean, we can make the best policies here till the cows come home, but if they're not legitimate in the eyes of the people that ultimately have to deal with them, we won't make any headway. So we've done our best to look at the impact assessment because every change that will happen, whether it's induced by policies or whether we back off and it will happen, as I said before, it's gonna happen with or without us, any change has impacts. So we came up with a social climate fund to compensate, but to compensate so uh, people that want solar panels, people that want to insulate their home, people that want to change their ways. Because I think most people, I mean, they don't necessarily want to eat grass or live in cold caves. But I think if you ask people, they're reasonable. They'd like to make a better change, but they don't always know how, or there are no alternatives there to help them. You can't just tell people, go drive a Tesla. So part of our policies is there, it has to be a socially fair and just transition, very important. And then when it comes to uh, uh, raw materials, I mean, I'm not gonna pretend here that whatever we do is like, you know, there's just the perfect solution and then there's a terrible solution. There are trade-offs in everything we do. And I think Isaiah Berlin, uh, uh, one of my favorite philosophers, he explained very simply how freedom and equality are great principles that we all subscribe to. But if you're absolute in both, it can't work because they work against each other. And so it is uh, too, uh, when we talk about raw materials, the dilemma is we need rare earths, we need minerals, we need raw materials to get the technologies to bring us there to this transition. Now, mining those materials are terrible for the environment. So that's why we're also thinking, so our economy has to be truly circular. We have to make sure that we don't waste any of these materials, that we reuse them, that we repair stuff and all of that. But these trade-offs are there and we cannot pretend uh, uh, they're not there. And, and finally, because I was, we're not talking about it, but I was triggered by what Vili said, it only takes a fin obviously to not be naive how energy can be used. And it's something we have been too naive. And this is something, and I, I wanna mention it, it comes down to what rationality is. We always have a sense that we project our psychology and our rationality upon the rest of the world. The other world is also rational, but they weigh interests differently. They look at things differently. And our failure of imagination, our failure of imagination, uh, is hurting us. It is hurting us in how to assess others, how they will treat us, but it is also hurting us to understand that democracy is not irreversible. 
If, we're, if we fail to imagine that, we might get there. And it also finally, uh, the failure of imagination that yes, once climate uh, and biodiversity tipping points could lead to an uninhabitable uh, swaths of the earth. And, and uh, that I wanted to mention that, so thank you. Great, thank you. And I'll hand over to Ville. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. I have actually a train to catch to, to uh, leave Strasbourg, so I'll, I'll just speak briefly and then I, then I have to go. But it's been a very interesting debate. And I will just focus on the, the question on the raw materials and circular economy, because when we look at the upscale of, of uh, energy transition, and we know that renewables uh, scale up is really, really fast in a number of European countries somewhere, it needs to be even faster. The economics are there. We just have to make sure that the permitting and, and all the practicalities around it can be solved. But then we can't do this only by scaling up renewables because the amounts we will need in energy production also when it comes to raw materials are so huge. So there needs to be all, all the time a huge focus on energy efficiency, energy savings, consumer uh, demand side uh, uh, flexibilities and, and also creating an energy market that is holistically as efficient as possible. So we will use storage, we will use uh, different uh, ways of, of uh, making sure that, that, that like uh, low uh, uh, electricity prices, uh, when we have a lot of wind power coming in, then we can turn some of that into renewable hydrogen or store it as, as uh, heat in underground caverns, caverns with, with heat pumps. So we have to make sure that the system is uh, effective in a way to make sure that we need as little resources to, to create it as possible. And uh, I think we have to uh, make sure also that the biodiversity component stays here all the time very visible because uh, we can't solve the climate crisis only by increasing demand if we can't uh, solve the way how we use land. I have to say also one thing which is seldom mentioned but has a huge effect. When uh, the Finnish uh, 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 foundation Citra that does uh, kind of like expert analysis on, on, on different environmental issues, other issues as well, but they made an analysis about circular economy and where we can get the best uh, outcome in, in increasing circularity and reducing demand of materials. And the biggest area is agriculture and food production, obviously. We sometimes don't remember that the amounts of meat we produce uh, creates a lot of pressure on land use globally to create all the soya, soya we need to produce then and or to, to, to feed our livestock with. So we have to also look at uh, a transition in the lifestyle of uh, what we consume, what we eat, how we produce it, alternative proteins, all of that. And, and the technologies are there already, but we really need to make sure that all funding for fossil fuels and outdated models of economy that creates a, a huge burden for the environment, that those models of economics need to be changed, that the ex externalities uh, needs to be included in the price, also in the, in the food chain. Uh, then when we do that, we do have a lot of alternatives that can create jobs and, and sustainable well-being in Europe. We are progressing well in some areas, but in some areas, there's still such a conservatism that we haven't even started and we still have fossil fuel subsidies. So that's a place to get some of the financing for the social just transition that Anthony is speaking about, that we need to make sure that there is money to make sure also that the poorer households are part of this transition. And in the 2030s, I think with huge uh, investment in electrification, for example, in traffic, we will have cheaper cost of, of, of living on the countryside when it comes to logistic costs, because electrical cars will be a lot cheaper than current uh, dependence on fossil fuels. So it's not, not a question of only increasing costs as some like to, to paint it. It's also about creating a more sustainable, flexible future for logistics in the 2030s. Now I have to go. Thank you very much for this. and, and uh, Look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much, Villa, for joining us. And thank you for these comments. I'll be ha actually happy to um, build on some of the things uh, that Villa said. And uh, I'll be happy to uh, for Anthony and Sandrine to comment on the, if we look at the EU's tools and instruments, it has a number of instruments available from policies to financing to ease convening power. And I'll be happy to hear from you if you could reflect a bit more on um, on 
are there any tools that you would see that there would be need to be a stronger focus at the moment because these could provide immediate results that would be good for people business and the planet or are there some tools that you think uh, we really should be looking at because of their fundamental role in getting us on the right track in years to come or are there actually, and we, for example, have been talking about the demand side, maybe this is one of those areas that should be further developed. Do you see that there is a bigger role for the EU and EU policies, financing, EU's convening power to actually accelerate action in some parts? Um, and I picked on the demand side because that has been reflected um, already quite a bit. But if, if you think that there are some other areas where you think that we should strengthen EU collaboration, I'm very happy to hear um, on that as well. Do you want me to go first or Anthony? Sure, absolutely. Go first? No, okay. Anthony, you can go first. Thank you. Um, it's a shame that um, that Vila have, has had to leave us, but um, but I I think yes. I mean, this is the key the key question, right? What are the tools in the toolbox, and what can we do differently? And and I think there are different angles to that. The first is we have to remember that actually the Green Deal in its concept is already moving towards a systems approach and i think that is not properly optimized across the policy we need to stop the silos even inside the european commission it's getting better but it's still not as good as it could be and we definitely need to stop the silos at the member state level you know one of the if if we look for example at the recovery plans what we saw in our analysis is that 80 percent of the funding went into climate mitigation very little went into adaptation and almost nothing went into nature and actually that the environment ministries were not talking to climate and definitely not economics or finance and so this has got to stop because the complexity of the issues is so intense and because this is a social and green deal that if we don't bring from the outset the economic ministries or those that are focusing on economic policy as uh, alongside climate and environmental policy, it just won't work. So that would be the first thing. We have to change our governance structures. In fact, um, someone from the International Trade Union Confederation, Montserrat, who I work with a lot through the Economic and Societal Impacts of Research and Innovation Expert Group that I chair for research and innovation, for DG Research and Innovation, said something which I found so telling. She said, you know, we are now really transforming in terms of our thinking. We've got new tools, we've got new potentials. We know we have to get rid of perversities in the market. What's not being transformed is our governance structures in order to enable that transformation to go faster. We already know in terms of renewables infrastructure, in terms of new infrastructure in general, whether it be energy efficiency or renewables, permitting times take far too much time. It's a bureaucratic nightmare. Member states have not changed the rules to enable us to truly invest in what matters. So this is, I think, one area that, that is fundamental. Systems and then really shifting towards new governance models. And, and I guess the, the last key point would be clearly, and having worked on the taxonomy, I have to say this, we need to continue, and this is my call, my plea to the European Commission, as we're now looking at the new governance format for the consultation for the next stage of sustainable finance. For me, this is going to set a precedent because the Commission and the European institutions must continue to have open consultation processes that are driven by science-based decision making, tapping into the greatest minds across the board, whether they be in industry or whether they be from the academic community or from the investment community, and ensuring that we stay true to the principles of our climate neutrality goals and our European Green Deal goals. So making sure that as we move through this very complicated policy making, that we bring in the right people to have those discussions, not get caught up in allowing for the usual lobbyists and incumbents to steer us away from our goals but really tapping into the incredible minds that there are across Europe, the incredible innovation and the potential to really move forward faster. And, and I think we can do that with business leadership as well as citizens, the youth, and also scientists and economists. Thanks, Anthony. 
Yeah, so I, I think we, we did not answer a question, I re realized, uh, from the first session, but we can, we can, we can bring that in uh, when you speak about, so the question was whether we don't have to renew a 2018 strategy towards climate neutrality. Well, in fact, I think the Green Deal is that. And in fact, the Green Deal was the map and compass towards climate neutrality. But then once the, uh, uh, there was agreement that to get to 2050, you need to, in the meantime, also increase your ambition to cut emissions. Uh, we got the at least 55% uh, less emissions in 2030. And we came up, we, I'm, I must say, the, the services, especially DG Klima, which, which did a hell of a job, but did a hell of a job with other DGs as well. And this goes to the point of silos. I'm, I mean, I'm not, uh, every organization has its, its routines and its procedures. Uh, and, you know, we're in the midst of a paradigm shift. It's absolutely true. And you can see that in the commission, but I, I think that the, the evolution of how people are working together, we saw it with Repower EU, is, is truly inspiring. Uh, so I, I think we're on the right track. We're not there yet, but we're, I think we're light years ahead of some countries and some continents, to be very honest. We're really trailblazing. But that 50, fit for 55 uh, and everything that belongs to that is basically our ticket to climate neutrality. So I don't see that we need another strategy. We need the policies to, to, uh, to be implemented uh, to get there. And, I, and recovery, uh, I mean, I hear you, Sandrine, um, not perfect. Uh, but pretty darn good already. I mean, I think the first the first uh, feedback we get of how these recovery uh, uh, funds have been used uh, with with a dominance of you know do no significant harm and 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 greening your economy, uh, I think is a good push. But okay, perfection. You know, we're, we're not there yet. Permitting, fully agree with you, which is why the reason I think in Repower You we. We tried to tackle that. I think for, for wind farms, you need nine years of, of permitting, which is crazy. Uh, and for solar, what is it, six years? So we're trying to attack that so that we can really shorten those leads and, and quickly, quickly ramp up that. When it comes to uh, 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 taxonomy, when it comes to policies, when it comes to inclusion of the best and the brightest, I fully agree. But I would also argue that the, 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 the EU's decision-making procedure is probably the most transparent decision-making procedure there exists. We have a transparency register. We have a public consultation where anyone can, can just join in. But at the end of the day, while we should be guided by science as much as we can, we do not operate in a vacuum. We are in a political context. We have to deal, and that's, a, that's the democratic way. Uh, we cannot impose because we have, you know, computer says no or computer says, yeah, this is the best solution. We are in this political context and we try to steer our way and navigate as best we can. That doesn't always lead to the uh, scientific optimal solution, but it does lead to hopefully the most legitimate solution at this time. And then we set into motion a development and we will build on that as years come, I'm sure. Uh, again, you know, there's so much more to do. There's so much more political courage to show, uh, but I'm professionally and personally very confident and optimistic that we are trailblazing this green transition. And if we manage, we can show business and other countries to follow suit, and I'm, I'm confident they will. Thank you very much. To finish off uh, with the final round of questions, uh, I would like to come back to the issue that we did want to reflect also on the lessons of the past. So if there would be one message that you would like our audience to remember, what has been some good cost-effective example that has been taken at times of past crisis that you think we should revert back to now, be it during the 1970s oil crisis, perhaps with the green stimulus that was given uh, uh, as part of the finance, when we were trying to react to the financial crisis or recovery funds during the pandemic. Is there something that you really would like to pick up on that that really was a good thing that we did at the time and we should come back and go back to those lessons today? And uh, as another final question uh, to you is, Obviously, and there's a role responsibility for member states, for business, for people all to play a part. Um, and there is, to some extent, perhaps not yet on all levels, a recognition about the urgency of action, about the costs of inaction. So can you just finish off by saying that what do you think are some of the, what do you think are the risks 
should the EU and its member states, the businesses, not align the actions taken today with the vision and goals of the Green Deal? What would those risks be for them? And why is it so important that they themselves um, are part of this EU-wide, society-wide mobilization today? I'll start with Sandrine, if that's okay. Okay. Um, interestingly enough, I was in California when the rationing program started on energy. Um, and actually, I had this conversation with the Timmermans cabinet and also with the von der Leyen cabinet asking me whether rationing was a, a smart way to move forward. And we've given some economic feedback on this. I, I personally think that in times of need, we really do need to get back to some drastic measures. And and I what I would like to say, though, is that we then need to build on what that transition path looks like when you come out. Um, in California, there were a series of policies that continued, whether it be on water usage or whether it be on on oil and gas. But then, of course, once the situation went away, at least on energy, we went back to business as usual, and that can no longer happen. So I think the message there is build on, if we're putting in place extreme measures like rationing, which we will need to do, it's going to happen, then communicate with people. And to be frank, one of the messages I gave as well is, let's talk to people about solidarity. I think that most Europeans would do this in solidarity for the Ukraine. I actually think if we told them we're doing this so we don't hike up the price. And this is exactly what happened in Australia, by the way, when they had a really deep water crisis and the water companies had two choices, either hike up the price so extremely that they would have riots in the streets or go to the people and say, hey, guys, if you don't want us to hike up the price, then let's reduce your usage and we'll tell you and give you tips as to how to do that. So this level of communication is fundamental. So that would be the first learning that I would bring forward is don't go back to business as usual after you've had radical measures in place, build on them, keep them, build in efficiencies and optimize these efficiencies, but show the benefits to people by making sure that it's not a cost crunch, but instead it's actually supporting them and becoming much more efficient. And then the second point that I would make in terms of what is at loss here, the loss is huge. We are no longer going to go back to business as usual. We are in the midst and will continue to be. And unfortunately, the limits to growth predicted it 50 years ago um, and the Club of Rome predicted it. I mean, exactly to a T in the 2020s that we would have a series of tipping points. So we cannot go back but we can be smart, we can seize this opportunity, we can be much more strategic, we can put in place what we finally said we would put in place even 10 years ago with the first climate and energy package. And, and I think again, though, we have to be very clear to member states, we have to bring them on board and that's the difficult part, but we also have to be clear to citizens. And I actually think to be frank that mayors, Local communities and citizens are much more on board in many cases than national governments. So working with the local level, working with the mayors, really getting down and, and showing that incredible leadership that von der Leyen is trying and that Europe can really continue to build on at a much broader level across Europe. As I said, the surveys are showing European citizens and global citizens are ready for this but they need the leadership. And I'll make one last remark, which is that having been on many calls recently with Janusz Potocznik, former commissioner, he says, we need to shift from leader shit, excuse my language, to leadership. And I think it's interesting coming from a former commissioner. And I think he himself realizes the gravity of the situation. And really it's time to step up to the plate. Thanks, Sentry. Anthony. Final words. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. So first on the risks, I'll turn it around. Um, I recently uh, started, but not finished, a book by Jeffrey Parker called The Global Crisis. Uh, I should have read it a long time ago. This is a huge book. And I, so I bought the abridged version, but it was still like, you know, really thick. But it was so interesting because what he did was he put together the history of the 17th century. He connected it to all meteorological evidence and basically showed 
that a one degree Celsius decrease, so it was the little ice age, which had nothing to do with humankind, right? It was just nature. But the amount of devastation it wreaked in terms of governance, in terms of migrations, in terms of food problems, uh, uh, lost harvest, and just uh, uh, war, ravage, uh, regicide, you name it. Now, I'm not saying this is where we're ending, but I do think, again, we should not have the failure of imagination to understand that the risks that we have, first of all, competitiveness. If we don't make this transition, if we think we can stick to old business models soon enough, we'll be outcompeted by others. That's not a, that we can't afford that. So it's, a, it's competitiveness and linked to that, obviously, prosperity. Second of all, health, our health and livability of our environment. Uh, these pandemics don't just come out of nowhere. The fact that the permafrost is melting in astonishing rate in, in Russia, uh, uh, you know, it's not only bad for their gas infrastructure was built on it. It's also worrisome because of old viruses that have been dormant for thousands of years might come up again. I mean, we think that if we if we beat COVID and we haven't yet, that that's it then for the next what hundred years. That's not true. Uh, so the zoonosis is a big problem. And then, of course, democratic upheaval. Our democracies are under pressure from without and from within. And, and these things don't help. So th th those are the risks. I, and I, and I, I don't like to, to emphasize the bad part, but I don't want us to have a failure of imagination. Then what, what are the lessons of the past? Well, to be very honest, I, 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 I'm not like Sandrine, uh, as somebody who's been in this business for a long time, I, but I can remember, I'm 52, that's no secret. When I was three years old in the US, four years old in kindergarten, I was read Dr. Zeus. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure it's still allowed, but uh, the Lorax, I read the Lorax. They knew them, uh, and I've used it internally at the deforestation uh, special chefs that we had, and people rolled their eyes, they didn't know what it was. We knew them. So what should we take? Uh, I don't know, but what I would think we should need at least as a bit more confidence in our ability to withstand and change our habits. It is possible. And if anyone says, I need to go on vacation four times a year, well, I'm lost. Uh, it's not, again, as Mr. Timmerman says, we're not asking people to, to, to chew grass and live in cold caves. What we're asking is a change, little changes can have dramatic effects across the board. And the funny thing is that the young people who understand it's their future that's on the line are educating their parents. As I experience home, when my children teach me a lot of things, uh, including this. So I would like to take that away. Have some confidence. We, we can, especially in this, in this part of the world, we can really stand uh, to change our habits and still and, and have a, a, a very good life quality. In fact, we can improve our life quality if we do so. So I'd, I'd end on that. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here. I'm, I'm really grateful that I could be with Sandrine and also Ville, who unfortunately has left. The same with me. Thank you so much, Annika. And it was so nice to see Anthony again, because the last time we were together was pre-COVID. With poor Boris Johnson on the with stage. With Boris Johnson and the vice president. And the vice president. In, uh, yeah, yeah. So talking about the planetary emergency. So there you go. Indeed. No, thank you so much, um, Anthony Sentry, and obviously Ville, who was here and had to leave. Um, it's been a great discussion. And thank you for providing this, really, what I would say is a powerful reminder why and how Green Deal can provide us the guiding light as we try to navigate through the crisis of today. And um, just to finish off, just to say, at EPC, we obviously we look forward to continuing this discussion in the context of the Green Deal for Real series, as well as in the context of other EPC activities. And uh, thank, you, thank you again for, for our panelists, for our participants for joining and wishing you all a really lovely day and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Good thank luck. You. Bye. Take care.